2000, this great year of liberation, in the roughly 2000, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act approximately does the same thing for commercial purposes. And by and large, it seems to me that the community has rolled over and accepted that. And so, you know, simple rule, the government does it, it's bad, industry does it, it's good. We all work for industry, but you know, that's all that. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting to mention the historical incident there. It's when we first learned about these issues, and, and I think the, uh, there have been a number of sea changes since then in terms of attitudes. Uh, it is amazing to me still that uh, the U.S. government uh, adopted as a standard the AES designed by some Belgians. Uh, and so the international world of cryptography is alive and well. The export of algorithms around the planet uh, goes full force. Uh, the export of software, on the other hand, is a much more touchy subject. You know, who knows who could read Skype? So uh, I think that there, there, the, the rules still have some teeth, but uh, I think that the uh, progress of academic cryptography and the publication of algorithms is, is largely unconstrained, and that's the way it should be. During the 70s, when I was working at MIT, I had great fun watching the American system going into all kinds of contortions uh, by watching a non-American working on cryptography. I was even told that uh, lawyers at MIT were debating whether I, as a non-American, should be allowed to read the papers that I wrote there. <laughs> it also wasn't clear whether by the mere act of going through the airport, flying uh, outside the U.S., I was exporting cryptography. So, <laughs> fortunately, those days are over, and uh, one thing we should notice is that the sky didn't fall, you know. Everyone was warning that uh, it will cause a huge damage uh, to the U.S. national security if uh, cryptography will be disseminated. Yeah, I'd like to mention two stories with regard to the openness of crypto. So like, like uh, the other panelists were saying, crypto research these days is quite open. There's a worldwide community of researchers working in cryptography. In fact, I'll, I'd like to mention that uh, the International Association for Cryptographic Research, the IACR, runs a conference uh, called AsiaCrypt. Uh, that moves around Asia, and this last December, this conference was held in Beijing, uh, just to show how open the, the, the world is. I happened to give a, a, a talk, a, a, an invited talk at that conference, and the number of uh, Chinese cryptographers who attended the conference was staggering. I think it was over 150 cryptographers uh, or so um, who, who were there. They all told me that uh, Chinese investment in computer science research, research, in particular in crypto research, is kind of uh, going through the roof. Unlike uh, you know, investment in research in the U.S. and Europe, uh, where budgets are slightly shrinking, so there's a massive amount of effort in, uh, in research investment in the, in the Far East. Um, the odd effect of that is that there are uh, many, many PhD students in cryptography uh, and computer security at Chinese universities. They actually don't have enough advisors, so it's not uncommon to have one faculty with 40 PhD students. So if anyone here is interested in uh, becoming faculty in, in, uh, you know, in, the, in the East, there's a, there's a great need. Of course, you'll have to deal with smog, but that's a, that's a different issue. Uh, the other story I wanted to tell you in terms of openness of cryptographic research is what Ari mentioned uh, with our experiment with teaching cryptography online. So there's a massive effort uh, at Stanford and at other schools, including MIT and Harvard, uh, to move many of our classes online. Um, and in fact, many faculty in the department, including myself, are uh, uh, busily recording our lectures, making everything available for free online. The movement is called uh, uh, MOOCs, uh, Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, and they're attracting huge amounts of uh, participants. In particular, I moved my crypto class online, and I'm doing, we're doing the same for our computer security class. And just uh, to give you an idea of the numbers, uh, the class, the first time it was offered, uh, it was started last March. I had something, something like 50,000 uh, students who signed up for the class. And the class restarts every nine weeks. And so now we're up to our uh, fifth iteration. By now, something like 150,000 students have uh, taken this class, specifically studying cryptography in the open. It's a Stanford-level cryptography class that's available for everyone. It's worldwide. So the largest number of students are actually in the United States. But it's remarkable that the second largest groups are in India and China. So we use Google Analytics to see where students are coming from. And it's quite interesting to see that some of the students are actually coming from rural parts uh, of India. It's not just the major cities. 
Uh, so now, you know, standard level edu education is available to anyone in the world uh, in, in, in these areas of cryptography and computer security. In cryptography, there's been, uh, I would say, a common thread. And there have been several key papers pointing out that good cryptographic algorithms have been improperly deployed and that this has created vulnerabilities, SSL, TLS, in particular, pointing. But what do you think have been the most important results and attacks of the past year? What things did not make the headlines that should have? So, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about the recent attack on Bit9, a uh, security company. So, this is a company which is dedicated to preventing uh, attacks on uh, uh, computer systems. And uh, their systems were attacked, and uh, they had a very interesting excuse. They said that they forgot to use their own software in some of their servers. <laughs> That's the only reason that they were successfully penetrated. But uh, this uh, just uh, continues a long line of uh, previous attacks. I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, uh, the various attacks on certificate authorities, so there were the older attacks on uh, Commodore and DigiNotar, etc. This year there was a very interesting new development. Uh, it uh, was revealed that uh, one of the uh, certificate authorities abroad, namely Turk Trust, that's a Turkish uh, national uh, certificate authority, uh, admitted that by mistake it issued uh, two high-level uh, certificates which enabled uh, the organi government affiliated organizations in Turkey to impersonate Google. So uh, I think that you will see more and more uh, events like this where uh, the certificate authorities which are operating under pressure from governments are going to behave in strange ways. And this really brings uh, into light the question of whether uh, the basis of security, the uh, PKI, is uh, under severe strains at the moment. You know, that, uh, your mention about uh, certificate authorities calls to my mind um, a wonderful note published under the name Mark Moxie Marlin Spike. Doesn't sound like a birth name to me, but it is a real, real person. Um, and what I conclude, uh, he and I differ a little bit about this, what I conclude from what he wrote is that certificate authorities ought to be working for people who want keys rather than people who are advertising keys. And I think that would go a good distance towards solving those problems. Uh, that you, you could go anywhere from a, a certificate authority that sort of rubber stamps whatever other people put out to one that, you know, does auditing and flat foots it around and so forth. And in particular, he said a thing that I thought had not quite the right connotation, but was related. He said, you know, why should any American organization be allowed to ch sign Chinese keys? And I thought, well, you can't stop them from signing what they like. The question is, why would any Chinese be interested in that? And I think they wouldn't. But on the other hand, particularly one can imagine regulations under which U.S. companies doing business with U.S. government, using Chinese subcontractors, whatever, would be obliged to get their keys from a CA uh, run by uh, DHS. So, I, you know, what to do about this as a marketing problem, as a business problem, is not clear, because we have a business that's oriented in one way, and to turn it all around uh, would be quite an accomplishment. It's clearly a very rich. dynamic environment. We need to have situation where the relying parties need to be able to specify in a fluid way exactly who they want to be trusting and then the paths that are allowed for them. And we don't have that with the current set so up. As long as we're discussing certificates, I'd like to mention uh, like a, even, a, even a more basic problem with, uh, with uh, certificate verification. So uh, it turns out uh, there's lots of client code out there that's implementing SSL and TLS and needs to verify server-side certificates. And that code is actually not browser-based code. In fact, anyone who is implementing a cloud service and has a mobile app, for example, that mobile app needs to verify, it's not a browser-based app, uh, it needs to verify the server-side certificate. And so we did a study, that this is joint work with uh, Vitalik Malikov at the uh, University of Austin, Texas, Austin. Um, we kind of did a study of uh, various open source systems out there that uh, need to verify certificates. 
And it turns out almost everywhere you look, you see that uh, there's a misunderstanding of how server-side certificates need to be verified. And the minute there's a mistake in verification of server-side certificate, that introduces what's called a man-in-the-middle attack. And so all those apps can, fi can be fairly easily defeated by a man-in-the-middle, uh, which is, even though the PKI infrastructure worked correctly and uh, the protocol was implemented correctly, the single mistake is that the server-side certificate was not properly verified, and that introduces a pretty significant vulnerability. So, and sophistication of cyber attacks, and the fact that uh, ordinary users have handed over reams of personal data to social networks and email providers, is the importance of cryptography diminishing? And uh, if so, how much? Hey. In effect, um, even the most secure uh, uh, locations, uh, the most uh, uh, isolated computer systems had been penetrated over the last year or couple of years by uh, a variety of APTs and other advanced attacks. So, in a sense, we should completely rethink uh, the question of how do we protect ourselves? Uh, so. The, um, the security uh, industry traditionally had uh, thought about two lines of defense. The first line of defense is preventing uh, the, um, the insertion of the APT into a highly secure computer system. So these are all the antiviruses, etc. Phase number two, there are many companies which are trying to detect the activity of an APT once it is there. But history shows us, recent history shows us, that many APTs that survived both the first line of defense and the second line of defense and operated within highly secure systems for many years. So now we have to think in a totally different way, how are we going to protect computer systems, assuming that there are APTs inside already, which cannot be detected? Is everything lost? I claim that not. Uh, there are many things that you can do because the APT basically is going to have a very, very narrow uh, pipeline uh, to the outside world. And we have to utilize uh, the vulnerability of this APT, which is sitting very lonely inside the secure system, being able to communicate very infrequently and with uh, a very small amount of data with the outside world. And I would like, for example, all the small data to become big data just in terms of size. I want the secret of the uh, Coca-Cola company not to be kept in a tiny file of one kilobyte, which can be exfiltrated easily by an APT which is sitting in uh, Atlanta in the headquarters of Coca-Cola. I want uh, that file to be uh, a terabyte, which cannot be exfiltrated. I want uh, many other ideas to be uh, exploited that will prevent an APT which is there, which cannot be detected from functioning efficiently. So it's a totally different way of thinking. What prevents the malware from compressing? I'd like to mention that another possible defense is just not to collect the data in the first place. So you might imagine, uh, instead of collecting a lot of information about how users uh, use the internet and, and browse the web, maybe we either not collect the data in the first place, or maybe we, we collect it in such a way that it's only available for specific tasks, so that now APTs, even if they do break into a data center, they have not much to steal. Uh, it's another possible line of defense. A good example would be, for example, uh, uh, Google Sync allows you to store your browser history in the cloud so you can easily move from browser to browser. Uh, they could have done that in the clear, store the browser history, you know, all of our browser's history, they could have stored it in the clear, in the cloud, and now if APT got into the Google data centers, they have everybody's browsing history. Uh, but of course, what they do is they allow you to encrypt it uh, using a client key, client password, and that gets stored in the cloud. So now there's much less incentive to break into their data centers and steal that data. So whenever possible, reducing the amount of data collection is a way to also re reduce the amount of, of risk of uh, APT coming after you. In Second World War, if you had good crypto protecting your communication, you were safe. Uh, today, with an APT sitting inside your most secure computer systems, using cryptography is not going to give you uh, much protection because the data inside is either going to be unencrypted or if it is encrypted, the key is going to be used occasionally, then it can be grabbed by the APT. So it's very hard to use cryptography in an effective way 
if you assume that an APT is watching over the computer system, watching everything which is being done, including the encryption and decryption processes. It's probably a good idea to bring up one more case where cryptography is, uh, is kind of essential. Uh, so think of uh, medical devices, like uh, pacemakers. So these pacemakers are embedded in our bodies, and actually Kevin Fu at the University of Hamburg has done tremendous work in explaining how they work, and many of them are actually programmable and accessible via Wi-Fi from the outside. And unfortunately, they actually don't use crypto today, which you can imagine the type of attacks, you can only begin to imagine the type of attacks that are possible once someone, anyone can program uh, a pacemaker, for example, or other medical devices. So that's an example where cryptography, I'd say that's the killer argument for why cryptography is, is absolutely essential in, uh, in many different environments. I think that uh, in terms of my own work, I, I'm still very much fascinated with the issue of voting, and voting integrity, and voting security, which can have cryptographic applications or other uh, technologies. In particular, I've been looking at uh, post-election audits recently as, as a technology where you've got, I don't know, big data, you've got a pile of ballots to look at it, you want to use some in this case, we're looking at Bayesian techniques for evaluating whether the election outcome is correct or not. So making sure that your uh, computation has not been corrupted, in this case, is very important to our democracy, making sure that you get the, get the right outcome. And using whatever technology is, is important, whether it's crypto or something else. In this case, I think statistics has a, has a powerful role to play using Bayesian techniques. And we're seeing a lot more of this in the, the forensic side of things, too, for statistics. It's a very similar kind of situation. We've got a lot of data. You want to figure out if something looks anomalous, and, and you a Bayesian approach to, to do that. So, uh, let's see, I love working in uh, computer security and cryptography. These are both fantastic areas, uh, lots of excitement, lots of interest. Uh, I guess I'd like to just maybe leave you with two ideas that uh, we developed over the last year. Uh, so one I would uh, categorize more as on the, on the privacy uh, side of things. So what we showed is um, that on a mobile device, there are lots and lots of sensors, and these sensors have imperfections in them. And it turns out these imperfections are actually fairly easy to measure remotely. So the, 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 the best example to give you is the accelerometer on a mobile device. So the accelerometer is accessible actually from JavaScript downloaded from a remote site. And it turns out that JavaScript can simply measure uh, the, uh, the accelerometer, just ask for accelerometer readings again and again and again, and measure the imperfections in the accelerometer that's unique to your device. And it turns out that actually generates a fairly unique fingerprint that's specific to your mobile device. So as you visit a website, it can very easily kind of measure this unique device fingerprint, and when you visit the website again, it can measure it again and tell that it's actually you visiting. The interesting thing about that is even if you reset all the software on a device, reinstall everything, this fingerprint uh, survives, and there's really no way to get rid of it. It's kind of a, a specific hardware uh, artifact that's just specific to you. So it's kind of uh, interesting to point that out, and the lesson of all this is that maybe access to the accelerometers should be more regulated than, uh, than it is right now.